I'm Jan Dekkers. I uh, <coughs> am working at Newcastle University, which has funded uh, the making of this video today. And the reason why it's funded it is because Newcastle University has an engagement and place fund. And this year they are particularly keen on encouraging initiatives to take research out into the world um, and particularly to engage with the agenda of the COP26 meeting which is taking place in Glasgow imminently. So the climate crisis, which is the topic of this uh, meeting in Glasgow, is something that Rebecca Humphreys and myself have done a lot of thinking about. Rebecca Humphreys, who's sitting next to me, is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Trinity St. David in Lampeter as part of the University of Wales. Do I describe that correctly? That's right, and that's where we are at the moment, in the Founders Library on the Lampeter campus. Um, and my job today is to have an informal conversation and to interview um, Jan Deckers of Newcastle University, um, who specialises in bioethics, environmental ethics and animal ethics. And we're here today to have an informal interview and conversation about the things which interest us the most in our research, including stuff to do with climate change and the treatment of animals. And in fact, it's my job to interview you as well, of course, yeah? And uh, Rebecca has got similar interests. Uh, it's fair to say, I think, that your specialty in philosophy is in environmental philosophy and animal ethics. That's is that right? right? That's yeah. right, yes. So, perhaps, if you don't mind me asking the first question, what triggered your interest in this field of philosophy? Well, going back many years, uh, when I was a teenager, I started to find out about factory farming and the ways in which animals were treated, mainly through campaign leaflets, by charities such as Compassion in World Farming and so on, but also through charities that um, campaigned against animal experimentation. And the more kind of knowledge I obtained about these practices, factory farming and animal experimentation, the more I was shocked really and uh, deeply moved and distressed and, and didn't really know what to do um, about the treatment of animals. When I went to university and ended up studying philosophy, um, to my delight there was an area of philosophy called animal ethics and um, this was an area which uh, focused on things that I was already thinking about. And so that's how I got into um, animal ethics, but also there are, of course, strong links between our treatment of animals and the environment. So um, that's how I um, subsequently became interested in environmental philosophy. Okay. And can I just ask, in relation to factory farming, what do you think triggered your interest in that? Is it something that you have experienced yourself? Had you seen how animals were treated on factory farms or had you been reading about it or had you um, seen videos about the treatment of factory farmed animals? Um, I have seen videos, images, um, rather than being on factory farms myself. Um, and, you know, it's mainly the suffering of animals yeah. that, that I'm concerned about. Yeah. So, so, if I throw the question back to you, Jan, um, the first question, which was, you know, what made you interested in environmental ethics yes. and animal ethics? I kind of landed into this field almost by accident, actually. I was studying religious studies around 1990, and as part of doing these studies, in the final year you have to write a dissertation. And I didn't quite know what to write my dissertation on. You could say I wasn't the most engaged student. So I went to see this professor who had an interest in the philosophy of Levinas. 
And uh, I asked him, because I quite liked his teaching, I asked him, you know, I need to write a dissertation. Could I write a dissertation about the philosophy of Levinas? And he said to me, well, I've already done a lot of work around Levinas, so maybe there's not such a great need to do further work in this area. But I have a PhD student of mine who's now uh, a postdoctoral researcher, or perhaps he was just a junior lecturer, why don't you go and see him? He has an interest in environmental ethics. Mm. Um, so I went to see him and he managed to persuade me to start working on environmental ethics. Mm. Now at that time, I would say I was rather strong anthropocentric in my outlook. I didn't really question very much the way in which oh human beings relate to the non-human world. But gradually through, through studying and through reading lots of papers for the, for the dissertation, I became more and more interested in this. And within the area of environmental ethics, I also soon developed this idea that not all things that are part of the environment matter equally, i.e. animals matter more than plants. Mm. At least so I thought. And I still think that's the case, that in our dietary choices, say for example, we need to primarily, if we can, consume plants rather than animals. So, as a result of starting to think about that and also starting to subject my kind of farming background uh, to scrutiny, I then started moving away from my dietary choices that I'd been brought up with and I became a vegetarian at the age of 21 because I didn't like the way in which animals were treated in factory farms and I also started to realize that a lot of this, these farming methods are detrimental for a lot of environmental issues including of course the topic that's being the subject of the COP26 meeting, the climate crisis. Mm. So yes. I guess it's a little bit similar to how you developed yeah. an interest in that. In the, but there's also a little bit of difference in the sense that a lot of my family members were actually involved in the farming of animals. Mm. So I have kind of personal experience of mm. how some of these animals are treated mm. in the dairy farming, in the uh, pig farming. Mm. So, yeah. And of course, I used to raise pigeons myself. And I have some experience of how pigeons get treated by pigeon fanciers who do not always fancy pigeons, they fan they're fancy races. So you've been on two sides of the, of the debate really, you've been on the side which um, maintains the support of factory farms and yeah. um, the dairy industry and the way cows and calves are treated, but also um, now you're a vegan. Yes. Yes. It took me 10 years to move from being vegetarian yes. to being vegan. Well, that's interesting. I've been um, vegetarian since I was about 14, uh, when I first became aware of um, the treatment of animals in factory farms. And um, I, I think that veganism is a good thing and it's the right thing to do. Um, and I have tried to become vegan many times and um, I'm not a strict vegan in the sense that I will buy some things which have milk in sometimes. Um, however, I think I should be um, vegan, uh, f fully fledged vegan. I right. think there are good reasons for that and I expect we'll discuss those in this uh, conversation. Um, However, I also think that capitalism has got a lot to answer for with regards to our own choices and what's available to us and the cost of food and so on. Um, and I don't think that vegan food is more expensive, but I do think that there is milk and um, factory farmed eggs in nearly everything that we buy. You know, it's very, very hard yes. to, to be a vegan. I'm, quite lucky that I, I know how to cook healthy food and so on, but not everyone does yes. know how to cook um, healthy food and cheap food that's vegan. So that's also um, an, an issue. 
Um, and of yeah. course, I think that meat eating and the consuming of um, dairy products is, is so entrenched in in our society, and uh, the meat industry has such power um, over um, many of our choices, our consumer choices, that I don't think we're as conscious as we would hope to be with regards to our own meat eating, with our own food preferences, not our meat eating preferences. Yes. And it's, all, it's almost as if the, um, the suffering of animals is just so far removed from people's lives, uh, yet at the same time it's right in front of them every day. And I find that despairing almost because if you are vegan or vegetarian, you know the ways in which animals are treated, you see it everywhere. Yes. But, but other people don't other see people it, you don't think? don't see it. I don't think they do Or they do don't want it. to see it? Is that what you're suggesting? I don't I think, think... Maybe both. Uh, maybe yeah. some people don't see it. Others don't want to see it. Yeah. It's um, such a... Um, I mean, we're talking billions of animals that every year suffer horrendous sufferings. And, you know, that's something that's become... That, that sort of wide-scale oppression has become the norm. Yes. It's so normal that you can't see it. Yes, and of course, ironically, it's become the norm, but at the same time, a lot of people don't seem to be wanting to be in, directly involved in the business of killing animals, because at the moment we're having this slaughterhouse crisis, right? Mm. We are needing to import butchers, right? Mm. I saw a headline the other day in a newspaper, uh, that was save our bacon, mm. calling upon people from the European Union to come to the United Kingdom to work in slaughterhouses. And presumably this is because this is not a career that many people aspire to. So people kind of know about it, I guess, but they don't want to know about it be because right, yeah. they, don't want, they, want, they don't want to work in the business of slaughtering animals, but yet they want to carry on eating the animals. So we have now this moment where a lot of pig farmers uh, do not know what they need to do with their pigs. So they're killing them in, in the pigsties and in the fields if they are lucky enough to be living outdoors. Because they can't send them to the slaughterhouses. Because there's not enough workforce to slaughter them. Which people are outraged by. Um, so, however... <laughs> That outrage seems misplaced to me because were they sent to a slaughterhouse, um, they would get killed in a less humane way than if the farmer kills them on site. And so there are issues there as well, I think, with the ways in which animals are treated in slaughterhouses. But as you rightly said, people don't want to do the killing. They don't want to um, kill animals in slaughterhouses. And and, and, and it's a brutal job. Killing a pig or a cow is not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to kill a chicken. If animals will fight for their lives, and it's not true, I think, that animals just go peacefully to their deaths. Yes. And, of course, uh, I think the workforce in slaughterhouses are exploited as well, and there are strong links between um, psychological conditions, um, harmful conditions and the, the working at slaughterhouses, that desensitisation that occurs and compart that extreme form of compartmentalisation is, is um, it's bad I think for the human, for human emotions and um, there's more research coming out on this now which, is which will be a really interesting um, field of further study I think thinking about how working in these slaughterhouses affects the humans in question, yes. the humans that work in them. Yes, I can imagine it might be desensitizing. Um, and you might need to sort of try to desensitize yourself to the suffering because otherwise you would not be able to handle it. Yeah. In, a, in a sense, I also had to do this myself. I, I say that I was strong anthropocentric in outlook. But perhaps in views I might have been strong anthropocentric in the past, but maybe not necessarily in feelings. 
because at the time I used to raise pigeons, mm. I always had great difficulty in slaughtering pigeons uh, because I don't know whether you're aware of this, but if you raise pigeons, a lot of pigeons need to be killed regularly because the ones that don't perform, you should not breed from them. You should continually breed from the ones that perform the best and there's simply not enough space in the loft for them. Mm -hmm. So pigeon fanciers are very familiar with this practice of killing pigeons. And from a very young age, this is something that for me was very upsetting. So after I've become vegetarian and carried on raising pigeons actually, I was still involved in, in, in this business and thinking, what, how can I be involved in this? Whilst at the same time being a vegetarian, it just doesn't fit. So uh, I sometimes wonder whether I am particularly sensitive in feeling that I couldn't kill these pigeons myself, right? Because that's what I used to do. I used to take them to the old pigeon fanciers in the village who used to kill them and eat them. Eventually, many of them passed away and then I had to start doing this myself, mm. which was heart-wrenching for me. It was really difficult. But it was something that was part and parcel of the business, right? So, yeah, in fact, that's one of the articles I'm writing right now. Apart from dealing with the, the climate crisis, I'm also writing an, an article on the ethics of pigeon racing. Mm. So, which I think you've, you've heard me talk I about did, at yes, the recent conference. At the uh, Philosophy of Sport conference. Yes. Can I ask you a question then in relation to what you've just said, which is that um, if we think about factory farming and, and just move away from the, the pigeon racing at the, at the moment, although it is relate, the issues are related, is it the suffering of animals or the killing of animals that matters then, or both? Very or good is question. one worse than the other? Very good question. So when I first became a vegetarian, I kind of rationalized away the killing of animals because I say animals, they die anyway, right? Animals die anyway, but I would like them to have a nice life. And I know that they're not get, having a nice life. They're suffering in many of the conditions in which they live. So I became a vegetarian in the beginning who carried on eating fish. So I wasn't a complete vegetarian in my early days. Because I thought, ah, fish, at least they've got a nice existence. They get killed quickly. That's so I thought. They don't live in factory farms, at least, at least non-factory farm fish, because that's also rising enormously at the moment, but maybe less so in the 1980s, 1990s, right? And then I started questioning that, and this brings me nicely to your argument from existence, doesn't it? Right? So I started saying, well, actually, is this just a rationalization? Yes, killing an animal can be a good thing to do in some situations when the animal is in terrible suffering. Mm. But it's not the case that simply because an animal will die anyway, that it is all right for us to kill the animal, is it? Mm. Isn't yeah. that connected to your argument from existence? Yeah. Well, let's, let's put it this way. There are some forms of existence that, uh, that um, are not worth having, I think, as a form of existence, and, and that goes for human life as well as non-human life. And in those situations, there may be um, cases in which killing the animals in question is justifiable. However, if an animal lives a good life, then that isn't some kind of proposition which justifies the killing of the animal. Um, because if an animal does live a good life, then to kill that animal, we take away all that is good for that animal. And animals have interests other than not suffering. Um, they have interests in continued existence. And I think in living a life which is natural to their own kind, um, an exercise in their own species specific capacities whether those be mental ones or physical ones just as humans do um, and so to kill an animal that's having a good life is to take away all that's good from, from its life um, now there may be cases where killing an animal might be justified 
um, when interests conflict, um, but the sorts of interests, the serious ones that conflict in cases of the eating of cheap meat, of factory farmed meat, which is the majority of meat on the shelves or the only meat on the shelves, um, killing uh, animals for that meat can't be justified for the preference of eating cheap meat. Yeah. And just thinking about this actually, because I mentioned about living a life natural to uh, their own kind. kind. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite interested, as you know, on your work on naturalness and degrees of naturalness. Yeah. I've been trying to think about that myself and how to incorporate that in some of my, my own work because it's it's relevant and um, and it, I think it's really, really helpful. So uh, would you be able to say something about yes, your absolutely. ideas on <clears throat> um, naturalness and the ethical issues involved? Yes. So I've written a paper recently which is called On Unnaturalness. The UN is in brackets, so it's on naturalness as well as on unnaturalness, trying mm -hmm. to make that distinction. And the ethical implications of that paper still have to be drawn out. But I can already see where I'm going to go with this. I think the unnatural, for me, is associated with human culture, artificiality, if you like. Now, I am not questioning for one moment human culture. Human culture is a fantastic thing. So the unnatural, in that sense, is great. However, that comes with a big caveat. Mm. I also think that there's a lot of value in naturalness, i.e. allowing things to be what they are, allowing animals to live according to their kind, mm. not distorting the way they live, um, allowing them to be, uh, allowing them to continue to exist in their ecological niche which is not shaped by us right which is why you might if you think about this distinction between the natural and the unnatural question the domestication of animals as such because the domestication of animals precisely takes something out of nature and puts it into an artificial human-made context however it's not easy because a lot of the animals who we have uh, taken out of their natural context may not necessarily have the right ecological niche anymore because we have transformed the planet so much. So uh, some of the domesticated animals have come to depend on us for their existence. So they might need to continue to exist in an unnatural context because the natural context from which we originally took them is no longer there, right? So it also creates problems. So we can't just say, let's release all the animals, right? And let's see how they thrive in the natural environment. Yes, the environment might be more natural than the environment in which they live now, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are still adapted to living in those environments. Having said that, I do think that for animals who can thrive in a natural environment, the project of de-domestication is one that I wholeheartedly support. Mm -hmm. So, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about your argument from existence, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. If I understood you, your work correctly in that, it's a sort of argument that the butcher once, one of the butchers that I know, once uh, told me, if people didn't eat animals, they wouldn't exist. So therefore, people should continue to eat animals. Mm -hmm. Is that the sort of argument yeah. that you're reacting against? Yeah, that's part of um, that's part of the argument. So, so the argument is originally kind of comes from Henry Salt's logic of the larder. Yeah. So it's exactly as as you just said, which is illogical, the Ill illogical nature of the logic of the larder, but an argument put forward for um, meat eating is often that, yes, if, 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 if we all stopped eating animals, um, then none of these animals would exist, so none of these animals would even have lives, let alone good lives. Um, 
I think the fact that a being is brought into existence, um, whether it, that being ends up have, having a good life or not, the very fact that something exists is no justification for the practice or the act that brings a creature into existence. So this might sound controversial, but it's an analogous example in the human case. If a child comes into existence through, um, through the, the mother being yeah, raped, yeah. then the child may well have an excellent life and a wonderful existence. That doesn't justify the practice of, of rape. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is with animals, is what, what you've just um, talked about, is that we're bringing in and this is particularly true with farm, 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 farm animals, we're bringing into existence creatures um, who, I mean, really, let's face it, billions of creatures every year um, for a particular purpose as well, and that purpose is to fatten them and slaughter them and so on. So I think we have to uh, bear that in mind as well, the purpose, the reason why we're bringing creatures into existence. We're not bringing these animals into existence in order so that they may have good lives and um, die a natural death and um, we're not bringing them into existence for the creature's own benefit. Um, so we shouldn't elude, you know, delude ourselves. It is for the creature's benefit that we are bringing these animals into existence. If, if we face facts, we'll know that once these creatures are into existence, they will live in existence, they will live pitiful lives and die horrendous deaths where they're, where they're very scared, frightened and treated appallingly. So it's not for the animal's benefit um, itself yes. that we're bringing that animal into existence. Yes. And to try and pretend otherwise is the kind of illogical nature of the larder that Henry Salt was talking about. Okay. It's the various forms of the argument for existence and and what all these arguments do is they appeal to the existence of animals as a reason or justification for either killing them, yeah. eating them or causing them suffering. Yeah, great. Thank you for clarifying that. That also makes me think of the sort of ecological theme that we should be talking about a little bit. We're sitting here in the lovely surroundings of Lampeter, yeah. where we have a, a hell of a lot of sheep farming around us, right? So what you're saying is that a lot of these sheep should never have been brought into existence, presumably, yeah? That logically follows from, from your argument. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, we should be doing different things with the land, right? So George Monbiot, I think, talked about the country being sheep-wrecked. Mm. Yeah, because the sheep are wrecking, wrecking the land. Mm. So this green and pleasant land may be, not be all that mm. pleasant, even if it's green. So in terms of the uh, the climate crisis, of course, sheep as well as uh, cows produce a lot of methane, as we know, particularly cows. They produce carbon dioxide. Um, a lot of the food is imported from a long way away. Um, this arable land that is used to cultivate this food for these animals could have been used to feed human beings directly. Mm. Right? So, if we think about the enormous waste that it actually is in many situations to farm animals, would you support the argument that we should then sort of not only stop breeding sheep, but also rewild large parts of the land, which presumably would also allow us to capture a lot more carbon mm -hmm. from the atmosphere yes. through the re regeneration of trees. Yeah. I think re rewilding is something that's been talked about quite a bit at the moment, isn't it? Reforestation. Um, that can only be a good thing, I think but I don't think it's going to be enough. Um, obviously, we're quite lucky living in the UK um, and we have quite rich and fertile land. 
and a lot of the devastation that occurs um, through or related to farming methods occurs um, outside of our own, you know, in, in, in poorer countries. And I think just to reiterate your point about the wastefulness of factory farming, or farming generally on a global scale, is that the majority of the crops that are grown in the UK and abroad, often in poor countries, um, of the land that's used in order to grow soya crops, not the soya that we eat as vegetarians, but the soya that's used to feed animals, land is often wrecked through growing those crops, and those crops are grown specifically for to feed the animals. Yeah. And it's, I think in many ways it's quite hard to imagine the amount of protein pellets that it takes to feed one animal, just one chicken for example, from birth to death. And if you're talking about cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, turkeys, on a global scale, billions of animals, that's a lot of plant um that we need to yeah. grow. Yeah. Uh, also, um, as you said, land which, which could be um, used for growing food to feed human beings. Now, obviously, there are distribution problems with supposing that would actually happen in practice, but theoretically, that, that could happen. And I think that the water as well, the water issue of the, the amount of water it takes to... Um, to rear an animal from birth to death is uh, that's a hell of a lot of water again um so and it's not just the amount of water that we use but it's also the pollution of the water the pollution of the water yes i think to talk about george mombio again i think he made yeah. a film called riverside right because a lot of the uh effluent from factory farms yeah. in wales is actually going down into the rivers and is causing eutrophication Mm. The, the algal blooms and this leads to uh, a very impoverished river system and the killing of a lot of fish as well as other living organisms inside the rivers mm. so it's a devastating so problem. A, there's a lot of poisoning you know which um, has happened or which could happen as a result of intensive farming methods. I don't know if you've seen these big pink lagoons they call them in the, the, the pig slurries in the United yes. States which is basically just pig poo and they're called pink lagoons because they're just huge masses of area which is just um, turned pink really from, from the pig excrement yeah. and um, there was a case of poisoning um, in the area uh, through the water and they couldn't understand how this was happening and that's again something that people don't like to think about. Yes. Um, so there are all these sorts of different issues to do with pollutions and how we deal with those because of the huge numbers of animals that we're, that we're rearing. Yes. And then that also takes me to another subject. We're talking about the farming of animals here, but we should perhaps also talking about the catching of fish, right, which I've become more aware of in recent times. Because a lot of fishing is trawler fishing, mm -hmm. and trawler fishing works by dragging nets across the seabed and destroying everything that's there essentially. All the plants that grow on the seabed are destroyed through the net dragging over the sea, over the sea floor. And this is something that really got me worried because this seems to be happening on a massive scale. Um, it's not just the fact that fish are being killed in you know being caught in these nets and a lot of them are bycatch the fish the people who fish them don't want them so throw them back into the sea mm -hmm. right they all they, they'll select the ones that they that they get the most money for mm -hmm. capitalism right comes into this again but also it's if we are going to be suffering more uh, effects of climate change the fact that we're destroying the seafloor is actually removing the buffer that protects us from fluffing, from flooding to some extent in many places mm -hmm. because this buffer is no longer there. The coastal sort of area where which is rich in biodiversity has been destroyed. So 
low-lying areas are much more susceptible to flooding because of it. Mm. Um, so that's also something I've, I've become more, more and more concerned about. Um, and of course, there's other methods of fishing as well that in include the use of cyanide in fishing, and uh, which is toxic. And then we've got the uh, salmon farms mm -hmm. in Scotland, where they put a lot of uh, chemicals on the fish to try to protect them from sea lice, etc., mm -hmm. uh, leading to problems with the wild salmon who swim by and who catch the sea lice but do not get the protection from the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So it's a never-ending story. So, so there is uh, what we've been talking about is, is industrial farming, isn't it? And uh, and I mean, my view is that there is a difference between this this business, uh, the meat eating business, and the indigenous person who goes to the river with a fishing line and wants to pull out some fish and cats, catch some fish, some protein for his family to eat for dinner. Um, there seems to be a huge difference between the ethics of, of the two. And in, in relation to, to climate change, um, there have been a lot of technological proposals put forward um, in order to try and combat climate change, many of which could have catastrophic consequences. So what what's your view about how vegan, turning vegan or veganism, what role could veganism play, do you think, in tackling climate change or in proposing solutions to climate change? Are there particular things we should be thinking about? Yeah, yeah, good question. So like you, I do think that there is a difference between industrial scale, scale sort of farming and what you call indigenous forms of farming, which are much smaller scale, but also perhaps more in keeping with not destroying ecosystems. Uh, and I, I also take the point that some people rely on animal protein uh, because if they didn't have the animal protein, it's not quite clear whether they would be able to thrive. So I don't think that univer universal veganism is the solution. However, I do v think veganism has got a, a really important role to play in climate change and the, in the combating climate change. And the reason for that is that in many situations, uh, vegans uh, use a lot less land and therefore use le a lot less water, etc. And by using less resources, they're using less CO2 uh, that goes into the use of land. Because by plowing the land, you know, the, the, the tractor uses right, fossil fuels, likely. And the less land we, we plow, the better. Right? So we should use, plow the land, yes, to produce animal crops. We, we should not feed the animal crops to the, to the farm animals. We should eat them directly. Um, so, I, I think veganism also can contribute greatly to uh, developing quick methods to reduce methane emissions, which are particularly coming from uh, ruminant am animals. If we reduce that number uh, significantly, then we could uh, avoid some of the dangerous climate change that we're expecting in the near future because over the short term methane is much more detrimental than CO2 actually. Also by not um, plowing so much land and by growing crops that are directly eaten by us and that fix nitrogen which is very big in, in vegan farming because you need to get your fertility from somewhere so nitrogen fixing crops are really important to grow. Um, you can actually trap more nitrous oxide from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And nitrous oxide, again, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So in, in many ways, veganism is, is a great contributor to reducing our impact on the dangerous effects of climate change. 
Um, and uh, it will also allow us, if many people turn to veganism, to very quickly release large areas of land that can be reforested. This all sounds amazing, I think, and um, this is why, I mean, the, the impacts, the, the positive impacts that um, eating um, a plant diet or a meat-free diet would have on the environment if it were employed, if that proposal were employed by um, people in the Western world, the impact would be huge and they would be uh, very positive. However, I, I kind of worry about the future so much because of the power of the meat eating, the, the, the meat industry. Yes. It's such a big business globally. Yes. yes. And um, so there's not just the farmers' interests at stake, which the government won't want to um, won't want to step on farmers' toes. But it's not just the farmers; it's also the cage manufacturers, the food suppliers, Absolutely. The, the, the 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 transport, um, the transporters, and then of course there's the other element in all this, which is the businesses themselves that sell these things, including McDonald's and and smaller businesses as well. And then you have uh, uh, one thing that, that a lot of people aren't aware of, I think, is how much the pharmaceutical industries are involved in um, the meat industry. So the majority of um, antibiotics that are produced globally go to animals, um, to factory farmed animals, intensively reared animals, to prevent them from getting diseases and, of course, um, we know we're, we're kind of a bit more aware of these sorts of things now with the COVID crisis, but um, keeping animals in very tight spaces with very little ventilation and no access to, to the outdoors uh, makes diseases rife, really. And yeah. it's just a breeding ground for um, animal diseases, but also zoontic diseases. And so the pharmaceutical industry has huge a stake in the yeah. meat industry. Yeah. And uh, I just worry about what we can do um, on a global scale because, you know, veganism and vegetarianism even, or even reducing or even converting to small-scale farming where animals are slaughtered in-house would seem better, much better alternatives than what we're doing now. In relation to how we treat animals, the environment, and humans. Yeah. But what are we going to do about you know how can we overcome these powerful? Yes. I'm not expecting you to answer this. No, but I'll I'll try but it nevertheless. It's something I, I I worry <clears throat> about a lot because yes. it does make people feel powerless. Powerless. I think. Yes. So that's where the power of capitalism comes into it as well. Which, ironically, you might say it's actually not capitalism; it's something else. Is the fact that a lot of animal products um, are produced regardless of the financial consequences because what you buy when you buy an animal product is not the full cost of that product because the animal industry is continually being propped up by subsidies mm -hmm. and by taxes that are needed to clean up the mess that is left afterwards and that or not factored into the cost of when you buy that animal product. So I think a lot of farmers are not into the farming of animals for the love of the animals, I think. They are in it to make money. So once you take money out of the equation, once you start really truly reflecting the cost that their business has on the planet, you, you will actually see that it's completely uneconomic mm -hmm. to carry on doing this business, at least in many situations. I'm not saying this is the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. There are some lands on the planet where it's very hard to produce arable crops because only grass grows well there, right? And in areas where only grass grows well because we cannot digest grass, it makes sense to some extent to keep some animals. Um, particularly if in those areas people cannot 
uh, have a secure supply of arable crops to eat directly. But in many areas this is not the case. In many areas an artificial system props up the farm animal industry. So once you start taking, really showing that economically it just doesn't add up, then I think many farmers will actually see and many policymakers will start seeing that, that it does not make any sense to keep on propping this up, up this system which is wrecking the planet. So, so but I, I think it's, it's not easy because people like to continue doing things in the way that they've always done things. You know, many people don't like change and many people think that they cannot see an alternative because the whole system is rigged towards producing these what we might call negative externalities. Mm -hmm. We should actually mm. take into consideration before we start doing th something whether it's actually going to lead to detrimental consequences that we are going to have to deal with. Internalize the costs. Internalize the costs. I mean, it's quite yeah. interesting because um, the majority of people, I think, when they, you know, when they think about or forced to think about the ways in which animals are treated for, the, the, you know, for for, for meat, um, will be, you know, shocked and aghast and just against it in many ways. However, when in the supermarket, browsing the shelves and going out to do the daily shop, wouldn't think twice about um, buying um, cuts of meat. And I think in the liberalist world we live in, there is a conflict there because animals don't really have the kind of status that humans have. And I think there's a problem, deep problem there. But in, in terms of the, the applied ethics of this, I think what happens is, a lot of the time, is that people view the choice of buying meat or not buying meat as that, as a matter of choice, personal choice, which they have a right, um, and yeah. they have a right to yeah. choose. Yeah. And of course they do in, 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 in liberalist society. Um, However, if uh, that same amount of suffering that went into that piece of meat were inflicted on a human being, um, we would be absolutely appalled. We would think it to be morally repugnant that um, someone, it could be a choice to purchase a product yes. that was involved mm. in that amount of suffering. And so I think there is a tension, you know, uh, or a deep conflict in liberalism which says that you know, I, I, I'm free to choose my own conception of the good as long as it doesn't harm any other human, but animals are out of the picture. Yes. Um, and I think that view of animals as just objects, the way we objectify them, um, is, is part of the oppression, really. they just treated like objects, and the whole lived experience of the animal is removed from the end product, and we, we don't have to think about it. Yes, yes. Um, it's an interesting point you yeah. make, I think. I think what we need to try and do is to make people more sensitive mm -hmm. to feeling the harms that we impose on animal, on non-human animals, right? And I think you might be right that many people perhaps are desensitized to that. But what they are probably not desensitized to is to the harm that they inflict upon other humans. So when we talk about the COP26 and climate change, many people conceive of this primarily in terms of oh this is an issue for us because it's going to impact on the human species right mm -hmm. and I think that's that's already good that they sort of have started thinking about the problem like that it would be nice if they took on board the harm that they impose on non-humans as well but even if you limit yourself on the harms that the farming of animals in many situations imposes only on human beings. I don't think this liberal argument that it's a personal choice really works because it, it breaks down, right, as you know, when you start harming others. Now, I think part of our job as applied ethicists, I think, is to make visible the invisible harm. 
and that's why we also need to engage with a lot of science okay what does the farming of animal animals actually do and how does it compare to other forms of farming horti horticulture say right how does it compare if you've got a particular area of land that's currently being sheep farmed say how can we conceive of using that land differently? Okay, and you need, an, you need a, lot, a lot of knowledge for that, mm -hmm. right? To make that invisible visible. Partly also because the invisible is the horticultural system that we might develop on that piece of land, but it's not there yet. So we need to find our inspiration in people who have developed um, vegan farming methods such as my part of my inspiration comes from uh, Ian Tolhurst. Ian Tolhurst is a horticulturalist who has been uh, growing uh, vegetables that he sells in a box scheme uh, near Reading for many years, for about 30 years I think, and he has done so without any inputs from animal farming. So he produces his own fertility on the farm to make sure that the crops keep growing well and produce nutritious food. And it's only through seeing examples like that that we can actually see, like, look, this is an acre of land that's in a sort of temperate climate that doesn't represent everywhere in the United Kingdom, but nevertheless, you know, a lot of land that's similar to the land that he's farming and that can provide this amount of food for people this amount of food and produce very little uh, pollution in fact it's become a site of scientific interest because the land is also heavily monitored by research organizations who actually look at how much uh, carbon dioxide uh, how much nitrous oxide etc how many greenhouse gases are being captured by the land as well as how many are being released so it's a great site yeah. to, to it's it. so interesting and I think there are so many innovative practices that we, you know we can learn so much going forward